Welcome. Um, so pleased that you are able to join us today. Um, my name is Namal De Silva, and I am the Chief Diversity Officer at the American Bird Conservancy. And um, it's my pleasure to host um, Virginia and Freya. I'm so pleased to announce this new partnership between the American Bird Conservancy and um, Birdability. And this is the first of six webinars about supporting birders with disabilities and other health concerns. Um, so please in, do in, continue to introduce yourselves in the chat um, with your name, one reason why this topic is um, important to you. And uh, we'll get started. So some logistics to get us started. Automated captions are available for this webinar. You can turn them on by clicking on the up arrow next to the closed caption CC icon and clicking on show subtitles. Um, you can drag the captions wherever you'd like on the screen. We're honored to have Kathy Silvern and Melissa Hines providing American Sign Language ASL interpretation today. We've adjusted the audience view to grid. Oh, um, please, we've adjusted the audience view to grid view so that you'll be able to see them. They'll be switching off throughout the presentation. Um, the webinar is, is being recorded and it'll be posted on the ABC and Birdability YouTube channels. Um, please submit your questions using the Q&A box. We'll answer as many of those as we can during the question and answer period at the end of the conversation. So this is, um, the conversation is for one hour, but we do have an extra 30 minutes just in case there's a lot of discussion or a lot of questions. So feel free to stay on after the formal part of the interview for that. Um, I'm gonna share a little bit more about birdability and the American Bird Conservancy for those of you who are new to our organizations. American Bird Conservancy, which is shortened to ABC, was founded in 1994 with the mission of protecting wild birds across the Americas. We work with lots of partners um, throughout the Americas, the whole Western hemisphere, to halt extinctions, to safeguard habitats, and to build capacity for bird conservation. We want more people to enjoy and care for birds and the environment, including people who have historically been ignored within the conservation field. Birdability is a new organization that uses education, outreach, and advocacy to make the, the birding community and the outdoors more welcoming, inclusive, safe, and accessible for everybody. Birdability focuses on people with mobility challenges, blindness or low vision, chronic illness, intellectual or developmental disabilities, mental illness, and those who are neurodivergent, deaf, or hard of hearing, or ha who have other health concerns. That's a lot. Um, in addition to current birders, Birdability strives to introduce birding to people with disabilities and other health concerns who are not yet birders. So welcoming new people in is what both of our organizations are about. Um, I'm going to go on and introduce our speakers. Um, and then I'm going to hand it over to Freya, who will be asking Virginia questions um, about birding with mobility challenges. So our guest and the founder of Birdability is Virginia Rose. She fell off a horse at the age of 14, and this fall resulted in a spinal cord injury. She's been a manual wheelchair user ever since. She began birding 17 years ago, and she discovered her best self in nature. Um, as a retired high, high school English teacher, she's passionate about birding, um, bringing joy and, and sharing the empowerment and sense of community that she found in birding and being out in nature to, with those who have mobility and other accessibility challenges. Um, Freya McGregor is our host. She is the birdability coordinator and will serve as the interviewer for all six of these webinars. Freya is an occupational therapist and her experience with modifying the physical and cultural environments with adapting tasks and equipment um, and with developing public health programs helps guide Birdability's overall approach. Her background is in blindness and low vision services. Finally, Erica Sanchez Vasquez, who is not on screen right now, but is on that slide that um, is in front of us right now, works with 
within ABC's communications team and has done a lot of the work that enables us to bring you this webinar series. Erica's background is in journalism and media within education and environmental organizations, and she'll be behind the scenes monitoring the chat um, and helping out as needed. So with that, um, I'm going to transition us over to Freya. And I'll be monitoring the chat throughout. So feel free to ask me questions as well. Thanks so much, Namal and Erica and the American Bear Conservancy. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Freya McGregor. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And as Namal said, I'm the Bird Ability Coordinator and an Occupational Therapist. I'm really excited to be here tonight. Um, this program has been a long time in the making, so it's really exciting to kick it off uh, as part of celebrating Bird Ability Week, which is another program um, that we're really thrilled about which will be October 18 to 24. So if you're interested in learning a little bit more or um, participating in any of those events, uh, they haven't been announced yet, that's coming next week. Um, please follow us on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter at BirdAbility or sign up to our newsletter, which you can do from our website, birdability.org. Um, there's a lot more coming, a lot more coming there. Um, I'm coming to you tonight from the ancestral home of the Muscogee Nation, uh, who were many of whom were forcibly removed by the US government to Indian Territory, but there are still a lot of Muscogee people living in Alabama today. So I would like to start tonight by extending my gratitude and appreciation for their past and continuing stewardship of the lands that I live, work and go birding on. Um, I'm really thrilled that we have closed captions and ASL interpreters tonight. Um, these are two things that sometimes cost more money, but help a lot of people uh, participate. And that's what we're all about. We're all about inclusion. And sometimes it costs more and sometimes it takes more effort, but we value that. And um, we're really glad that, that we have um, that support too from the American Bird Conservancy. Um, I also want to mention that throughout this series, we're going to hear from a really awesome group of birders who all have different access challenges, but we do not claim that um, these folks will uh, include every identity of birder or person with an access challenge. Um, and disability is diverse in many ways, including within the same access challenge or diagnosis. So please keep that in mind and that the views expressed in these interviews are of the person and no one else. Um, some of it may apply to other people, but um, we're not claiming that, that we're not talking for everybody here at all. Um, that's part of what makes humans so interesting. So um, let's get into it. Virginia, hi, welcome. <laughs> hi, thank you, Freya. Thank you, Namal. Thank you, everyone. It's wonderful to be here. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself a little bit um, and um, where you are and maybe how you got into birding? Okay, sure. Um, I am in Austin, Texas, and um, I started birding about 17-ish years ago. Um, you know, people ask me, how'd you get into birding? And I, I'm still having a hard time pinpointing exactly what it was. But I did have a grandmother who birded well into her 90s um, right here in Austin, Texas. I remember the binoculars around her neck. And actually, she gifted me um, her Peterson's guide, one of the it's not the first, the second or third, maybe edition. So anyway, probably got some of it from her. Sure. And what what is it? Um, so, so for those who don't know, Virginia and I work really closely with each other, um, setting up a brand new nonprofit. We just, Birdability became a nonprofit just this year. And um, we, we have spent many, many hours on Zoom talking about nonprofit things and disability and birding and inclusion and all kinds of things. So, um, Virginia, I know that you talk a lot about the different joys that birding brought you. Um, I was wondering if you might share with us a little bit about what, which of those joys um, that birding keeps um, bringing you back to, what is it that keeps bringing you back to birding? Um, I think I might just start with the joy, the moment when I realized that I needed to make sure that other people who had mobility challenges because that's how I started. I wasn't thinking about the whole rest of the world like, like you were Freya. <laughs> but my first thought 
at this moment when I was sitting in the woods and I was totally enveloped and I was all by myself and I was listening to the bird song and I was just struck with the wonder of being able to be in the woods by myself safely listening to birds. And I just thought this is my best self and I've got to make sure everybody can can get here who who may not know that they can do it. And so that's really how birdability started. But but what is it about birding that makes you want to, to keep birding? So um, when we're talking about the joys, um, you know, definitely it is the new, going to the new birding sites and finding the new birds, finding the old birds, um, having a chance to sit and study birds. Um, realizing that I can be on a birding path for four hours at a time without even realizing it. And just the time goes by so beautifully and so peacefully. So that's definitely part of the joy. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and historically, there has been a bit of an image, I think, of a lot of birders um, who the, the way that birding is done is by walking down a trail, checking birds off a list. But um, we know that there are many more ways to enjoy wild birds than, than just that one. Um, what, how, how do you bird? Um, I, I think I would be described as a slow birder um, in that I wanna check every single tree and bush on either side of me before I go farther down the trail. I, um, but there's so many little niches and places where they can be and I wanna listen to everything. And so I am definitely not running down the trail. I'm, I'm listening down the trail. So as soon as I hear something, I stop. And I usually don't leave until I figure out what it is. Sure, That's sure. one way. Sure. Yeah, and so speaking of, of moving down the trail, could you tell us a little bit about your disability and um, how long it has created an access challenge? I think we heard a little bit of that from Namal in the introduction, but also what kind of activities um, are challenging for you in your everyday life because of, because of your disability? Right, so um, I'm a paraplegic. That means I'm paralyzed from the waist down. Um, I have a fairly strong upper body. Um, and shoulders and arms to move my wheelchair around pretty well still after 48 years. Um, but um, when I'm wheeling and when I'm birding, um, I'm having to keep my eyes on the path in front of me and make sure that I'm not going off the path or off a cliff or off the trail. Um, and at the same time, try to keep my eyes you know, looking for the birds. I also, uh, because I'm having to have my hands on the wheels when I'm when I'm wheeling, I can't really bird. Well, let me say it this way. I can listen while I'm wheeling, but I can't use my binoculars while I'm wheeling. And I think the walking people have an advantage there. So I feel like they can kind of walk while they're birding. So, um, Definitely being in a wheelchair and birding has its um, hardships, but it's also got its advantages because I think I see things that other people don't see. Like I always get the olive sparrow first and I always get the oven bird first and I always get those toeies because they're all underneath the bushes. They're, cl they're closer to my eyes. Yeah, sure. You have a different, like not a figurative different perspective, but like a literal different perspective. Right. Folks standing but with you. Um, yeah, I know I've um, been birding with Virginia once, no, not once, more than once, um, but <laughs> in one, one period of time in August this year, um, we met up for the first time in person on our way to the Southeast Arizona Birding Festival, which was really cool. And um, it was, that was my first experience of birding with someone who was using a manual wheelchair. And um, it was, it was definitely um, really cool to see what you kind of ran into before I did or or um, making sure that we were both finding birds together, but differently. We, I, I felt like it. Um, we sort of helped each other out sometimes with, with, because we were looking at different places and paying attention to different things. Um, 
so I don't know if you... I really I don't know I don't know if I really answered that question that you that you just asked me did I well, well the question I asked so I was thinking about your everyday life not particularly about birding so um if if there's something that about using a manual wheelchair that um that's challenging in in your everyday life um well let's see um I've been in the chair for so long that it's hard for me to really stop and recognize what is and what isn't. But um, I guess I would just say that everything takes me a little bit longer to do, although I wouldn't admit that for 47 years. And um, I have a tendency to think that I'm not disabled at all. And so I will just run through my life thinking I can, I can reach everything, I can carry everything, I can push everything, and of course I can't. But I can do an awful lot. And I think one of the things that makes me um, an explorer is that the empowerment I get from figuring out how to do things is enormous. And so it may, I may find myself in a situation and I don't really know what I'm going to do. I'm like, uh oh, like I'm really good at going down a trail for miles and miles. And I don't stop and realize, oh, now I got to come back up that. How am I? Okay. So the figuring out of being in a wheelchair, I think is a really interesting um, experience. And I think it's made me incredibly strong and it makes me feel like I can do whatever I need to do. <laughs> and and really good at problem solving, it sounds like. As yes. Well. Oh, absolutely. Because you want to do the thing. And so you spend time figuring out, okay, what do I need to do in order to do it? So a good example for that, just really quickly, is that I was having trouble with um, cactus thorns in my wheels and I would get flat tires and so I said no more air filled tires although they're nice so now I have tubeless tires no more flat tires perfect awesome and speaking of flat tires I was wondering if you could give us a little bit of a tour of your wheelchair because there might be folks who are watching or listening tonight who aren't really familiar with with manual wheelchairs Right, right. Okay, tell me if I'm in the right place. I don't know how much you can see. I think I need to lower my screen a little bit. Yeah, maybe just a little. Yeah, that's better. Is that, can you see? Pretty well. I'm gonna lower it a little more. <laughs> Bear with me. Okay, that's, that's better. Good. All right, so. This is a manual chair. Um, I want you to notice how low the back is on my chair. I'm lucky that I have enough upper body strength to have a lower back because please notice the amount of space and what I call mobility I have behind me. And when you're in a wheelchair, space is a very valuable commodity. Notice also I don't have any arms on my chair. And again, it's because I want to optimize the space that I have on my lap and for, you know, whatever reason I might need this space. Um, I also, you might see the backpack that I carry on the back of my wheelchair, and that is a lifesaver. I don't know how anyone ever in a wheelchair gets around without a backpack. And then I also, I don't think you can see it from here, but right underneath, my knees, I have a little pouch, it's a zip pouch, and in it I carry all the things that a woman would carry in her purse, including lipstick. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Oh, and by the way, before you, um, before we keep going with questions, I was wondering if you could give us a little demonstration of a wheelie. Oh, the wheelie, the famous wheelie. Okay. This, I, I have to quickly say, for those of you who are really, really good at wheelies, please don't judge me too harshly. I'm 62 years old and I'm not as good at it as I used to be. So here we go. I might have to. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, perfect. Am I good? Yeah. Hey. Really? <laughs> Thank you very much. So why and why is a wheelie helpful for you? What does that uh, oh, allow you, you to do that skill? 
wheelie is just is such an important skill because when you are wheeling through the grass and uh, you want to get back on a sidewalk, you'll need to pop a little wheelie up the front to get back up it. Um, on the other hand, if you are coming down, like when you and I were birding together and we came down that kind of a steep sidewalk and the and the sidewalk was bumped up a little bit, um, I had to pop a wheelie over that in order to not end up like a wheelbarrow um, pitched out on the sidewalk. I also do wheelies when I'm going through turf. And, you know, you just get on your back wheels and you just stay on your back wheels because I have casters, little casters. And the little casters are great for all kinds of urban use, but they're not great when you're out in the wilderness because they'll catch on everything. So to be able to do a wheelie and keep it going through rough terrain um, just enables you to get other places. Same with same with ruts. You have to be able to do a wheelie to get around ruts and roots mm -hmm. and sometimes gravel. Sure. And it's, for those yeah. of people who don't know what a caster is, um, do you want to explain real quick just what a... Sure. Um, the casters are the little wheels in the front. And um, I actually was going to say something later about tips for people who are birders and are in wheelchairs that... The smarter wheels are going to be the bigger ones, obviously, with more tread and um, with a wider, um, a wider, just a wider tire so that you can wheel more easily through all kinds of different terrain. Um, but that would mean that I would have to have either two wheelchairs or two sets of uh, of mechanics to take the casters off and put the other ones on. Sure. Thanks. Thanks for the thanks for the wheelchair 101. Um, I should I should mention here just in case you aren't familiar with um, wheelchairs and people who might use wheelchairs. There's lots and lots of different kinds of wheelchairs for lots of different reasons. Lots of different people with lots of different disabilities and other health concerns use wheelchairs, and um, not not every wheelchair user is the same at all. It's a really diverse group of people. There's power wheelchairs that are um, driven um, with a battery. Um, there's manual wheelchairs, there's um, people who sometimes walk and sometimes use a wheelchair, there's all kinds of folks. So um, again, this is, this is not meant to um, be representative of every kind of wheelchair user. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks for, the, for the wheelchair um, and the wheelie demonstration. Um, sure. and, and yeah, not everyone who uses a wheelchair can do a wheelie either. Right. Um, right. So... Um, we sort of spoke a little bit already about how um, being a manual wheelchair user impacts your ability to go birding. And we sort of talked about a little bit about your problem solving um, that you have to do. I was wondering if you might share anything more about that, like how you work around um, the kind of obstacles that you might run into when you're, when you're out birding. Right. Um, I would say that when it comes to birding by myself, I tend to be a little more cautious about going off the sidewalks or off the paved roads. Um, but generally when I'm with a group and um, they are gonna be wandering off, for instance, on a path that's um, not doable for me, I might just poke around where, where I am quite happily um, and just, when I find that I'm getting into a path where there are a lot of roots uh, or there are a lot of, um, you know, obstacles in there, I try to like avoid that, but then do the wheelies that I have to do to manage my way out of it. I'm also very mindful of carrying with me in my backpack every single thing I'm going to need. So it's like Boy Scout, you know, it's like, everything I might need. I have scissors, I have plastic bags. I have you, it's like Mary Poppins bag. It's whatever you think you might need, I have it, so. Sure, yeah, yeah, be prepared. Um, um, and I wanted to ask you too about, um, I, I happen to know that you have a really cool piece of adaptive birding equipment. And I wanted to ask you a little bit about that. Right, that was such a great um, experience. Um, thank you for asking me that. Um, when I would go birding with all of my friends, um, by the way, they were all walking friends. There were no people in wheelchairs 
ever. Um, and so the guys would all, um, and the women would all jump out of their cars to put their scopes up and there'd be like this scope line and, you know, I would wheel up, but I didn't have a scope because scopes were hard. They were hard to manage. My walking friends always tried to help me with the scope, but it, trying to get a tripod around a wheelchair and get on the bird before it's gone is like difficult. And so um, I finally decided I'm going to get my, I'm going to get a scope. And so I bought a scope and then I wheeled into precision camera and I said, you guys, we need to get this, this scope attached to this wheelchair. And so they did, they came up and took them 15 minutes. They totally geeked out on it and they loved it. And it's like a, it's like a, a steel elbow, really, with a nice little bend in the middle and a G clamp that goes on the right side of my wheelchair. And it ends up with the scope right under my eye, like immediately under my eye. And my first experience with the group was when I was able to get out of my van with my scope already in place and I could line up with all the guys and I could look at the same bird at the same time as everybody else did. And I nearly cried. And I said, I'm in the scope line. And all everybody was just like, yes, you are. It was a very poignant moment. Yeah, that's really cool. And it's so cool that the, the adaptive equipment sort of allowed you to participate in a way that you kind of could a little bit before, but not sort of fantastically. So that's, yeah. that's really awesome. I'm just going to stick in the chat. We have photos of Virginia's scope and the components that, oh, not the scope, the, the, wheelchair, the wheelchair mount for the scope and the components that make it up um, on our website under adaptive birding equipment. Um, so that's just in the chat. Oh, no, it's not. That went, here we go. Let's try that again. Um, there it is. Um, as well as we have photos and descriptions of other adaptive birding equipment that we know of, that po people have told us about and things that, that I know about. Um, and if you use any adaptive birding equipment, um, we would love to know about it so that we can share it with more people in case it's helpful for them, because there might be a bunch of folks listening who would love a wheelchair mounted scope. So, um, yeah, that's super cool. Freya, can I say something really quickly? Because I think the, I think it matters. What was happening by me not being able to be part of the scope line is I was missing out on some camaraderie. What I I just a camaraderie. I call it scope camaraderie, where people are talking into the scope and they're all hearing each other, and it it's just a, an, an important community time and I wasn't getting to be a part of it and so that's what I want us to all be thinking about yeah yeah inclusion right there huh yeah, yeah. thank you thank you for adding that in um sure. so speaking of other people uh, I was wondering if you might share a little bit about um help and so I know a lot of people what want well-meaning people want to help others who have visible disabilities it's also especially worth mentioning that not every disability is visible, but um, folks with visible disabilities, often people want to help them. Um, what is the best kind of help for you to receive from someone else? And what would you want folks who are offering you help to know? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I think the very first thing I would say is that um, it's always, I think it's always right to offer help. And I think that it's also right for a person who needs help to ask, even though we may not want to. <laughs> it's still important for us to be working together that way. And if the seated user, if the person you're asking says, no, thank you, then you say, okay, let me know later. If it comes up that you need some help, I'll, I'll be happy to. And then that's perfectly acceptable. If the person says, yes, um, I do need some help. Don't jump in and start, you know, figuring it out on your own. The first thing you should do is ask them, how can I help you? Please direct me. And then that seated person will be able to give you some advice on how to do it. Yeah, sure. I, we were at an outing um, together and um, you, I know you wanted a hand getting up 
a curb. There wasn't a curb yeah. cut. Um, and um, right. someone who was trying to be helpful, um, who you, they, you'd ask for help, they'd offered, or they'd offered help, and, but they sort of just grabbed you by your backrest and tipped you back so far. I was like, whoa, whoa. And I whoa. think your face was <laughs> a little bit like, ah, because yeah. they had tipped you back so very far. And, and yeah. that, see, it looked to me like it was a little disconcerting um, yeah. for you. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, letting, letting the person be the guide in the help. Yes. Yeah. And I would also say that um, for people who are um, people who are in um, wheelchairs and might need help and but they don't want to act to take you up on it, they may I, I would just say their answer may be a little gruff, but I would encourage I would encourage the um, the wheelchair user to say instead of being gruff, no, but thank you so very much. I really appreciate your help because we want to keep everybody communicating on a happy, useful level. Sure. I guess you wouldn't want to put off a would-be helper no. so who doesn't offer help next time to someone who really, really does need it. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. Right. Well, well thank you. Thank you. Um, I would let me say something other one other thing about um, help. Um, I'm not easily helpable, but if something if my sunglasses or my hat fly off my head and go down a hill and I can't reach it, will you please please go get my stuff with, <laughs> without me having to, you know, make myself too miserable asking. <laughs> What about what about doors? I know doors are an interesting thing. Folks wanting to hold doors open for people in wheelchairs to, to be helpful. Yes. Um, what are your thoughts and experiences on that one? Yes, and it, that's an interesting question because uh, up until about five years ago, I was in charge of opening my own door. And so I did not want anyone, if they were coming through, fine. But if they weren't, I didn't want anyone to run to the door and open it for me. That was a comment somehow that was a comment on my ability and so uh, but now now that my shoulders aren't quite what they used to be um, now I'm very good about saying thank you for opening the door and please hold the door and you know yeah I think you just get to a point and you kind of just have to read the person you just have to read the person and if he or she isn't making eye contact with you that probably means they're not interested in help but if they are making eye contact with you that might mean they may be open to help sure sure and speaking of um so what i think i heard you just say then was um something about kind of accepting help and accepting your right um, kind of your functional capacity which is a super occupational therapy term but oh, right. like you know what you can do and, and what you can't do and no one can do everything and um so I wanted to ask you a little bit about um language and this sort of that ties into this a little bit and um we know that language is really important and it's it's always evolving we don't really say say thou very much anymore um and so um we want to make sure that we're using language that's welcoming um to folks and doesn't sound outdated or offensive. And mm -hmm. um, having spoken with you a lot about this over the last year and a half, um, I was wondering if you might share with folks your thoughts on the word disability and if you identify as disabled. Yeah, um, so when Freya and I first started talking about inclusive language, um, she, um, she kind of came in like, well, handicap is not the word people use anymore. And I'm like, she said, disabled is the word they use in Australia. And da, 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 like she was the boss of that. And I was like, hold on. You are a walking person talking to a person in a wheelchair. So step back a bit. And let me tell you that I feel like I am the most able person I know. And in some ways, when I hear the word disability or disabled, I'm like, I'm not at all a disabled person. I do not feel that way. And so I have the same reaction to the word disabled that a lot of people have to the word handicapped. And so that's the interesting thing about language. 
And, you know, the same with the word walk, because, you know, the the popular thing now is to not use the word walk when we're, you're talking about a birding outing, um, that you should call it an outing or an event and not use the word walk. And so Freya was explaining <laughs> was explaining all this to me, Freya, a walking person, talking to me, a person in a wheelchair, that I wasn't to use the word walk anymore, that I was to use the word events. And I'm like, no. I'm not, no. <laughs> so language is is like like all the other disabilities, right? It's all it's all variable. Yeah, I, I'm going to caveat that. I think when we were talking about what words we should use as birdability, um, but right, but right, a big message out of that is that um, it's not up to us how someone else identifies and and people are allowed to identify as they would like and we can't say that that's wrong so right um, I think that's a big take-home message there um we do have a um, link on our website in case um folks wanted to check out about inclusive language use um it's supposed to be a starting place as we've just heard <laughs> different people have different opinions on different words and um I know a lot of folks who um view the word handicapped is out of date. I also know a lot of people who, um, different communities, different age groups, people from different cultures, you know, there's so many variables and everyone's different. So um, yeah. I would encourage you to check that out if you if you would like a starting place. But if someone says, no, that's not how I go, then <laughs> I'm be the boss of that. Um, we're all learning, yeah. myself included. We're all learning and all we can do is the best we can do until we right. learn to do better and then we can do right. better. So, um yeah thank you thank you for sharing sharing about that yeah um, so speaking of of walking people um what would you like other walking people other than me um walking people to know about birding with someone who uses a manual wheelchair and what can they do to be sure to be welcoming and inclusive of you okay um, well, I made a list of like 23 things, so I'm, <laughs> I, I know we will not get to all those things, but um, I, I think the very first point I would make is that when you are in the presence of seated people and you're a walking person, um, it often happens that the walking people are having a conversation. And remember, that's two, two and a half, three feet above a seated person. And so often the walking people's conversation is excluding you. And I don't think it's meant to exclude you, but what walking people need to work to try to remember is that um, the eye contact and the conversation needs to include the seated people as well. And you have to be, I think at first, a little intentional about that to make sure that everyone feels included. Um, I guess I would say that's the first thing and that needs to happen as a in a birding situation or or otherwise clearly. Um, I would also say um, that again, every disability is different, but I do not like for anyone to make a fuss. I don't want to ever make a scene. And so it, it's best if you can just operate, you know, in sort of in a subtle way when you're trying to help be inclusive. And, you know, Freya and I talk about how do, how do we be inclusive without, you know, how do we let the person know that they're included without spotlighting them? And so um, I would just say that oftentimes when birding leaders are getting, when they're starting off their, their trip, they'll meet in a parking lot or something. And I would just say, make sure that that morning meetup is fully accessible, that there aren't, just be mindful of the obstacles that might keep a seated person from being able to get up right where everybody else is. Um, I would also say that um, it's 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 pleasing for walking people to want to help. They want they want to, and so we've touched on this briefly. But um, I would just say, particularly when you're birding and you're on a trail um, if the person in the wheelchair is hanging back um, there's no need for that person to be attended by other walking people and I think sometimes people feel like no I don't want to I don't want that person in a wheelchair to be left behind or left alone and you know I understand that 
but um, sometimes it's intrusive for a walking person to insist that he or she be accompanied. So those are just little things to think about. I would also say that when you're walking, when you're going down a path with a person in a wheelchair, he or she is going to be looking for the flattest, driest, cleanest path. And so what that means is if you're walking side by side, know that the person in the wheelchair is watching for that cleanest, straightest, path. And that means that you may need to be looking ahead and moving out of that way if you're if you need might need to change tracks is is what my friends say. Um, and it's always endearing when I'm walking, I'm wheeling with my friends and, and they know me really well. And so they they already know to, to move over at this certain point, because that's where Virginia is going to go. You know, they just already know. Um, I would also say that it's particularly endearing when I see walking people um, in front of me and or behind me using their feet to kind of clear debris. You know, people just start to become more mindful when they're walking and they just start like shoveling the stuff out of the way. It's really, it's really endearing, I think. Um, and I would also say um, if, if you are seeing a bird, um, I think the best way to help a seated person see the bird, if they aren't seeing it, is to maybe either get behind the seated person or at least get some idea about the way in which our vision is going to be affected. And so that way you can get a better idea of wh where I am in relation to the bird. The other thing, and you know, Walking people probably do this with, with everybody, um, which is to help them get on the bird is to be looking for a clearer spot. So a lot of times my friends will say, Virginia, come over here. There's no, there's no brush or there's no trees. So just being mindful of a lower field of view. And also along that same line, sometimes people walk in front of wheelchair users when we're birding because the wheelchair user is below that walking person's line of, of view. You know what I'm saying? So it's almost like when a walking person is is walking in front of in front of me, he or she may be looking at all the other heads above me and not being mindful of where mine is in relation to looking. So just be looking for everybody's view when you're moving around in front of people. Yeah, thank you. And um, for for all those other things that you listed, they're not going to go to waste. Um, no. We're really looking forward to creating a resource for our website that has all of Virginia's um, tips for walking folks who are birding with someone who's a manual wheelchair um, and all of your tips for walking folks. If you're a manual wheelchair user too, we'd really love for you to share your um, ideas and experiences with us. At the end of this, um, if you're watching live, at the end of this webinar, there's this little survey and it will have some questions there. And we would really love to hear your experiences so that we can anonymous, anonymously incorporate that into this resource that anyone can get hold of off our website. Um, the other thing this resource will have, it'll have tips and tricks for walking folks to be more inclusive of um, wheelchair users who are birding with them, as well as tips and tricks for maybe new wheelchair users or wheelchair, maybe long time wheelchair users who are new to birding. And so I was wondering if you could share with us maybe your top three, maybe your top five um, <laughs> tips for, for other wheelchair users and who, who are birding. Um, so what I'm thinking about is, um, like, let's see, can you rephrase that question? Sorry. Have you got any tips or tricks for folks who also use a manual wheelchair yeah. um, that you'd like to share in case it's helpful for them when they're birding? Thank you. Um, well, I, I guess I would start with the parking lot. Um, I'm, I'm seeing in the chat uh, some comments about parking spaces. So um, I would start with the parking. And, you know, you need to be a little more brazen as a person 
in a wheelchair. Um, whenever I cannot find a parking space um, for a van, because you know my van has eight foot clearance, needs eight foot clearance on the passenger side, and sometimes that's really hard to find. Um, so I don't think anything anymore about parking across two spots or three if I need them. And I have a little cone with a little wheelchair insignia sticker on it. And I fly out of my van and I put my cone down sort of like, bring it. <laughs> and so I would recommend that for any wheelchair users. If you need more space, take it upon yourself to get more space. That doesn't mean we can be happy about it, but you know, do what you need. Um, and then other tips, let me just go back to the backpack very quickly. Um, everything that you can carry in your backpack might be, you know, your field guides and your water bottles and your compass and your, you know, your coffee cup. Um, and so all the things that you need so that you don't have to go back to the van or ask anyone for anything, God forbid. <laughs> and um, so uh, other things would be to make sure that you're keeping yourself hydrated um, and that you are um, able to get shade when you need it. I know that lots of people who are wheelchair users sometimes have different needs when it comes to hydration and sun and shade. And I know you have one about your brakes as well when you find a bird. Oh, yeah, that's right. So, oh, so when I'm wheeling down the path, um, I might be wheeling down the path talking or whatever, and then I'll stop. I'll come to a quick stop. And this is when I should have told all the walking people behind me to pay attention because all these people are going to like stack up a bit behind me. But um, I, I will stop and I'll immediately go to my right brake and click it so that when I put my binoculars up, I'm not continuing to, <laughs> to wheel away down the sidewalk and miss the bird. So yeah, the brakes, uh, it's just safety main, mainly. Sure, yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, and so we're getting towards the end of the main part of the questions, but um, before we jump into the Q&A session, but before we get, before I finish up, um, I wanted to um, ask you a little bit about intrusive questions. I know a lot of folks with disabilities and other health concerns get asked by probably well-meaning, curious people, questions that are really not appropriate and not okay to be asked, especially if you're just out trying to go birding or you know, on a quick run to the supermarket or something. Um, and so these questions um, can feel really obnoxious and intrusive. Um, have you ever been asked any intrusive questions that made you feel kind of invaded upon or uncomfortable? Oh, in 48 years, I've been asked every single question you can imagine. Of course, I say that there will be another one tomorrow. There. Anyway, um, and you know, at different times, I've handled it in different ways. Um, I feel though, as I've, as I've aged that my job more and more as a wheelchair user is that of ambassador. And so by that, I don't want to waste any opportunity I have to help a person understand what it is to be disabled. And so what that means is when they ask me questions, like uh, the one I get a lot is what happened to you um, in just those words. And it, what I want to do is not make the person feel bad. I don't want to shame anybody for approaching a person in a wheelchair. Um, instead, I would say, um, well, have you got about 30 years to talk about it? I try to immediately introduce humor because that takes all the awkwardness out of it. And that means I assume a lot of the responsibility for, it, for those kinds of interactions. And I think that's important. You know that I've always I've always said that. Um, I have occasionally had questions like, "Well, how do you go to the bathroom?" or you know things like that. And then I always turn that into something funny. I don't answer, but I always turn it into something funny, um, just as a way to put the person at ease because I don't want them to be feeling bad, um, but also to let them know that that they don't need to ask that question. Yeah, yeah. And so I have with me a red flag 
Um, yes. I'm not sure that this is a standard thing, but my sister <laughs> used to tell me secrets in high school and she'd say, that's red flagged, which <laughs> was meant to indicate that I should not repeat this to anybody. Um, and so um, questions like, how do you go to the bathroom? That's, that's, that's not an appropriate question to ask someone um, right. you're birding with. Um, there might be times when um, you know someone really well or they've invited you to, to ask them questions or something, and that's different. But um, anything that you wouldn't ask someone who's non-disabled, mm -hmm. who you've just met, you probably shouldn't ask someone who has a disability or other health concern. It's not your business. Um, yeah especially if they're just trying to go birding in peace. But I have a couple, of, a couple of these invasive questions. And before I ask them, I'm just going to share that um, I did talk to Virginia ahead of time about these questions and she did give me permission to ask them um, in this public place, but they are all red flagged. So um, <laughs> here's my red flag um, to remind you, these are, not, these are not questions to be asking someone. Um, so... You said you had a spinal cord injury. Um, what level is that? And what does that even mean? Right. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a little difficult to answer a question like that um, because it's so, you know, medical. Like, um, again, I would have to answer it in a humorous way, but it's probably not the right question to be asking. Yeah, totally. And what about um, if someone if someone knew that um, because of your spinal cord injury, you mentioned earlier that you um, it's waist down basically. Um, so if someone knew that and they said something like, "So you really can't feel or move your legs at all?" Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> oh, I I always end up feeling bad for them. But... I don't know. That's my response. I, I think too, maybe this is another guiding thing with invasive questions. If it's something that you can go home and Google, go home and Google it. Like this person in front of you is not your resource mm -hmm. um, unless they've invited that. Um, mm -hmm. And here's another one. How do you even manage in your everyday life? Well, <laughs> I, again, I would in earnest try to answer that question. I think I'm not a good red flags person, but really, I think uh, your idea, Freya, is right about if you wouldn't ask a non-disabled person, then maybe it's not appropriate. And you know what I would recommend? Instead of asking those kinds of questions, maybe um, ask the kinds of questions that are more um, like positive questions. Like, ooh, uh, what is the best way for you to see a bird? Or what is the best way for you to um, help other people see a bird? You know, just those sorts of um, positive, curious, but not invasive questions, mm -hmm. right? Sort of questions like, that are about how can we make sure that we all have a successful bird adding together kind of that kind of question right rather than the nitty-gritty of whatever access challenge you have right because that's not really relevant by the way if we're if, if i'm if i'm a leader on a bird outing and you've come to to, to this outing with me it doesn't really matter those nitty gritty questions of your your daily life with the, with the disability that's not relevant to us having a good time birding together so yeah Maybe maybe it's more relevant for you to ask the person in a wheelchair about the bird they just saw or the lizard or, you know, maybe the, your interactions with that person should have more to do with what you're doing right then and what you're seeing and what you're hearing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sure. That's good. Sure. I also, I, I wonder if it's worth sticking in here. Um, it's, it's not like the person with an access challenge doesn't know they have an access challenge. So it's not, if, especially if you're leading and adding, it's not that you should completely avoid any mention of it. If it was relevant, then it would be okay for you to ask. Like, or, or like, like um, hey, Virginia, I know there's some stairs coming up. Um, let me know if you'd like some help with that or if we need to problem solve another way around that. Like, that's not invasive and it's, right pretty reasonable it, you're allowed right. to bring it up it's just that the invasive stuff is not okay 
Right, right. Um, I, I think also, um, if I can just throw one quick thing in, if a person in a wheelchair is rather new to birding, um, it, I would always recommend giving the field trip leader um, a call or emailing ahead of time to get more information, to introduce yourself, and to just plan for success. You know, people who have access challenges, I would like to see you do whatever you can to make it successful for everybody. And you know you best. Yeah, thank you. And so we, we're we about to jump into the Q&A and I know it's we're already up to an hour, which I mean, you and I can talk all day. <laughs> we, yes. we know that yes. already. Um, yes. But um, before we jump into folks' questions, and if you have to go, um, this is being recorded and will be sent out um, and available on our YouTube channel and the ABC's YouTube channel. So um, you won't miss out on this if you want to come back um, to, to catch up with these questions. But is there anything else before we get into other folks' questions that you would like to share about birding using a manual wheelchair? Um, just that I usually end up seeing all the birds that everybody sees, even though they had to climb a mountain and back down to get them. <laughs> so please don't think that a person in a, in a wheelchair is unable to see as many birds because they may surprise you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Um, okay, so we have one question here. It says, what kind of information about trail conditions and accessibility features do you look for on nature preserve websites? Is there specific information you look for that could help you to, to, to help you to determine if a preserve is a good fit for you? Um, can you say that again? Sorry, I was reading the chat. Um, <laughs> what, what kind of trail conditions and accessibility information do you look for on Nature Preserve websites? All right. Um, well, I don't usually do any of that. <laughs> I'm, I'm the one who gets in the car and gets to the end of the driveway and says, wait, where am I going? And then I'll Google Arizona or whatever. But once I do get to a trail and I see a map, mainly I'm going to look and see if it's a loop um or if it um like what the distance is i will look and see where the restrooms are i will um, look and see where the water is if there is water because i'm going to want a bird over there um and also if there are boardwalks because i love to be on a boardwalk don't we all what about trail conditions is there anything about like trail surfaces that you prefer or things like that um, for sure. So obviously the easiest trail is a sidewalk, which some people say is not a trail, which I understand. I understand. Um, I also love natural dirt trails. Those are really my favorite, natural dirt. Um, they're not as fun in the rain, but um, they are manageable. I also don't mind what they call a crushed granite surfaces as long as they've been well maintained and they aren't all full of ruts and erosion um, um it, mulch is impossible just so you know um any kind of mulch is impossible um so is sand so is gravel um and other surfaces that people don't realize like um there's a new surface like a rubberized surface it's like the kind of surface that you see in kids playground areas where they take shredded rubber or something mm -hmm. that doesn't work for wheelchairs but mm -hmm. they some I, someone didn't get the memo but um if you want more information folks about different accessibility features i'm just sticking in the chat um our webpage about access considerations and it has a lot more information it's not specific to manual wheelchair users it's for anyone with an access challenge and the sorts of things that um, might be relevant to who and why um, by the way speaking of surfaces um, we were birding in tucson and um, someone i have a dodgy knee and someone there lent me their manual wheelchair that their um that they had a spare one in the car and they lent that to me, which really helped because my knee was sick of standing and I was going to have not a fun time. Um, and as well as being so grateful to rest my knee, I learned quite a lot about birding from a manual wheelchair in that brief 
hour and a half period, I think we were out, including the difference in effort on my arms and shoulders and back from when we changed from the concrete path to the um, hard packed dirt path, which was pretty solid and easy to walk on but there was obviously a lot more friction on that between the the wheels and that um surface and so it was much harder for me being very unused to using a manual wheelchair um (laughs) that that and that would would have been considered one of the more accessible surface types but it was noticeably different so different folks who maybe have chronic fatigue or maybe they've got shoulder injuries or all kinds of other stuff as well as being a manual wheelchair user might um yeah different experiences with that yeah yeah Um, yeah the next question we have is please discuss how we can or should talk to a trip leader to set ground rules I think we being someone with an access challenge e.g don't hold back for me etc right um well the way I like to approach trip leaders is um not really to sort of set the ground rules but to mainly say look I just want to join you I want to do whatever I can of the trip I don't want you to change the itinerary for me and I also don't want to make I don't want to um um interrupt other people's participation but um wherever and however this planned trip they already have i just want you to know that i'm very independent and i'm very happy to bird by myself i will bird with you guys until you decide to take off on a part of the path that i can't do and then i'm very very happy to bird in the in the parking lot or wherever so please do not feel like i need to be attended and um we'll cross check our bird lists when you return yeah, so um, sort of open and direct sounds like your your general yeah. approach. But maybe maybe easier for some than others. Not everyone is right um, as confident or as assertive as um, exactly as you sound like you are when you're talking yeah. to, to yeah. these leaders. But I wonder if that's a practice thing too. And and the more you sort of practice that skill of being assertive, maybe the the more it comes easily. Right. Um, Well, I think part of what we want to do, and I'm not sure I really had to articulate this, is we don't want to um, make a lot of people uncomfortable by our being there in the same way that we don't want to feel uncomfortable, right, as a disabled person there. Nobody wants to feel uncomfortable. So I think we just keep that in our minds, right, as we're interacting with each other that nobody wants to feel uncomfortable. Yeah, right, right. Um, and that might lead me into another resource on our website, which is the Welcoming and Inclusive Birders um, page, which has some ideas about um, ways that you might be, uh, as a birder, and especially as a bird outing leader, um, more welcoming and inclusive of, of everybody, um, whether they have access challenges or not. Um, the next question we have, um, is asking you, Virginia, if you take pictures while you're birding and if so, what camera equipment do you use and where do you post your pictures? Because um, this person would really love to see any pictures or videos that you have. I love that question, mainly because I love to give this answer. Really, I'm managing a wheelchair, binoculars, a scope, a coffee cup, an app. You want me to do a camera too? (laughs) (laughs) no but I bet I bet there are a bunch of folks who use um, manual powered wheelchairs who take photos of birds while they're birding oh yeah I'm sure they're out there they're more talented than I am (laughs) well and of course because there's so many different ways to enjoy birds right and so maybe it would be easier if if you were stationary like checking out a bird feeder um, if you wanted to delve into photography um, that might be a different story perhaps than doing it while also moving down a trail. Um, yeah. Yeah, for sure there's, um, there'd be all kinds of cool adaptive equipment too. Like maybe the, oh, yeah. the, the mount that you have for your scope, maybe you could someone could mount a camera on that as well and that might be. Oh, helpful. yeah. They're doing that already. Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, if that's you, already out there. If there's someone out there who does that, please, um, if you would be willing for us to share it on our website, please send us a photo. Um, our info at birdability.org is my email address. And if you contact us from the website, it'll go straight to my inbox. So um, 
that would yeah it'd be great to, to be able to share that with more people in case it's helpful for them um oh here's a question um if there's any ideas about how to set up bird feeders that can be easily maintained by someone with difficulty walking and standing yes now you might need a walking person to help you get them set up but the bird feeders in my backyard were put put there by walking friends. And what we did is we got a length of chain, small chain, and we ran it through a pulley and attached it to the bird feeder. And then we just pulled the chain down and wrap it around a like a lock on the tree. I mean, I put a like a, I don't know what to call it, on the tree, like a place where I could wrap the chain. And so, I just go out there and I undo the chain, the bird feeder comes down, I fill it, I go back to the chain, I pull the chain back up, and then I secure it there. And the only time that's not a good idea is when lightning hits the tree. That's, <laughs> that's a whole nother story. <laughs> Bird feeders came crashing down, sprinkler system came on, garage came up. Oh, anyway, man. wow. Sorry. <laughs> it sounds like we need to write up your bird feeder um, situation yes. for our website so that more people can find that if they if they want some ideas um, for their yeah. own things. Yeah. Um, I'm just noticing too, sorry everyone who, I'm, I know the chat's been really busy. I don't have the skill of watching the chat and also listening and thinking <laughs> yeah, well. Yeah, evidence so, by me. <laughs> um, so I'm sorry that um, we've basically been ignoring the chat, but I'm really excited to read the chat after after this. And I, But I did see just then really briefly, I said, someone wrote, this is very inspiring. I sort of had given up. Yes. Um, I'm wondering if, you might have any anything, um, any kind of empowering thoughts? Yes, I, I saw that same chat, Freya, uh, that same note. Thank you. Um, I guess my feeling is that if I can go outside and explore, then I'm going to see something that I never thought I was going to see. Um, I, you know, I think we sometimes think we know we're going what we're going to see, but there are mysteries every day that are out there waiting for you to see it or waiting for you to hear it. And every time I go out, I come back feeling inspired, empowered, and happy that I have found the place where I am happiest. Yeah, yeah. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a five mile trek down a trail. No, right? no, there's no, no wrong way to enjoy wild birds. So whichever way you can. Um, yeah, I hope I hope I'm, I'm really pleased that um, that someone who's come tonight might want to keep birding because there's so many joys we can get from it. And there's so many different ways we can go birding. So yes, um, hopefully there's a way that that um, that you can keep going because it's just such a cool hobby and there's so many there's so many um health and wellness benefits of spending time in nature and yeah. the birding community is so cool if you can tell yes got a great birding community near you and um maybe you bird through webcams um at your computer or on virtual field trips or um maybe you participate most with the online birding community through Facebook groups or Instagram. That's still, you're still a birder. Like that's still, as far as I'm concerned, if you enjoy wild birds, that's birding and you're a birder. So um, mm -hmm. hopefully there'll be ways, it may not be the same as it was the way you used to go birding, but um, hopefully you can still. Um, yes, yeah, this is what, this is what my family says. You, uh, you are still birding. You might be, you might be birding differently. And I think sometimes hearing it that way helps. Mm -hmm. um, I too feel, you know, as I'm aging, that it's not as easy for me uh, to be disabled, as disabled as I think I am or not. So I, I do struggle with that a little bit, but I still do take a lot of, lot of pleasure by being outside and by myself, honestly um just spending time looking and listening and knowing that 
sometimes I try to think I'm here I am by myself in this forest or in this wherever and I'm seeing things and hearing things and that's enough yeah 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 um oh someone's asked how do you transport your wheelchair to your birding locations uh okay so um I have a a van it's a a van where i it has an automatic ramp that comes out and i wheel up the ramp and from the inside of the car i transfer to the driver's seat the driver's seat's remote so it turns in order to help me make that transfer and i just tie the wheelchair down with a seat belt it's very jerry-rigged but and probably illegal but anyway so then um i drive to wherever i'm going I find the parking space and I hit the button and the ramp comes back out. And um, I have a lot of stories I've written about not parking very well. And so the ramp leads off a cliff or the ramp leads into a water filled ditch or the ramp leads into a huge rosemary bush or something. The stories go on and on. This is another reason why you need to be out birding. The stories, you will come home with, I'm telling you, every one of you will come home with stories that you didn't know you were going to have that day. And how do you drive your van? Oh, yeah, that. Um, so the driving is with a hand control, and the hand control comes out from the left side. And I use my right hand on the steering wheel and my left hand on the hand control. And everything else is the same. Awesome. Um, okay. Um, uh, sorry, I'm just having a look at these questions. Um, oh, here we go. Um, for bird festival coordinators or, or Audubon chapter program coordinators or, or yes. adding leaders um, who labeled events as accessible, but didn't have very, very many people show up. Um, I was wondering about your experiences, because I know you've led a lot of um, accessible bird outings um, for Travis Audubon um, in Austin. And um, is there a word or title that would better describe it and be more inviting? Mm -hmm. um, I just like to use the word accessible and um, it may be less that you're not using the right word, and more that your message or your ad isn't getting to the right audience. Um, it may also be that in the description of the event, you could use such words as um, there are accessible parking spaces, there are accessible restrooms, the trails are wide. In fact, Fred, you have something, don't you? That Yep, it's in the chat. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Freya writes all this up. Here's really what happens. I talk and talk and talk and Freya is like really, really, really busy typing it all down and then putting it in a, on our website. Thank you, Freya. Yeah, so in the chat, there's a link to um, another one of our um, web, web pages about the sort of information that you might include when you're writing bird outing event descriptions. And most of the time, um, you know, we're going birding at this place, it's easy isn't really enough information for folks who need to know if the surface is paved and if it's a mile or is it five miles and is there shade, is there bathrooms? Um, and so if you can be, if you can include some of this key accessibility information in your outing event description, um, that might be the signal to the people who might have been wanting to come out with you who didn't know if they could, like you've, you've provided every um, everything that, that they might need to know without them having to ask um, and and in fact we would love to see every bird outing ever have this sort of information whether or not you're specifically um hoping that folks with access challenges will show up yeah another thing virginia i know you and i have talked about before with with holding accessible outings is that um consistency can be really important right like not many people might come to the first one but if you keep going yeah people will realize you're serious and the word will get out and, you know, slowly more and more people will start showing up. So if you do it once and it's not a raging success, don't give up because you'll still see birds or hear birds or 
bind birds. And so, um, right. And I, um, I think it would also be um, helpful for there to be a write up after that, that first accessible walk so that people who might be a little hesitant can see that, oh, there was an accessible walk. It was successful, you know, no, um, no, there didn't seem to be any issues. And, you know, that, I think that's good. Also, I'm noticing that for not just people in wheelchairs, but as people are aging, this importance of benches and who, you know, so many of us wouldn't realize that, but, you know, we like to say, of course, that birding um, accessibility is for everybody, right? As we're aging and grandparents and toddlers and stuff, that the importance of benches becomes more and more glaring, right, Freya? Like for you too. Yeah, for me with my knee and folks with chronic pain or chronic fatigue or people who just want to have a quiet sit. Um, yeah. Yeah, benches are really valuable. So mention, um, mention benches. Benches, yeah, yeah. Um, someone else, and now I'm kind of watching the chat a little bit more. Someone else said, and this ties in, is there a network of disabled people in a community where we could advertise our walks? So who have you reached out to in your community, Virginia? Well, this kind of, yeah, this touches on what I was saying a minute ago about finding your audience. Um, I decided that people in wheelchairs just didn't know about birding. And so I thought, okay, I'm going to make a list of all the places I can find people in wheelchairs. <laughs> I really did that. I'm like, okay, where are they? And so I made a list of where they might be. And the first one was the Spinal Cord Injury Support Group at St. David's here in Austin. And then um, the Amputee Support Group. And then the um, Multiple Sclerosis Group. Then the Stroke Group. Um, and then I went to Easter Seals, the Easter Seals gym, because there are gyms where all kinds of people who have accessibility challenges go specifically to work out because the gym has been set up for them. Well, that's the place to find people who are in wheelchairs or have other access challenges. So I put flyers up there and talked to their, their rec directors. I just made a long list of all the places where I could find people in wheelchairs. And I went and I talked to them and I got them interested and now they come with me on walks i set up monthly birdability walks and now they come yeah yeah by the way we should clarify that um even though it's a really great name um if you're not virginia or me um right please don't call your event a birdability walk or a birdability outing um, apparently there are liability issues and the organization might get sued if something went bad on your event. So that's why we recommend calling it an accessible bird outing or an inclusive bird outing. And there's a whole lot of um, really cool um, outings that are happening in October uh, with different Audubon chapters and bird clubs and nature centers and state parks holding accessible out bird outings to help us celebrate Birdability Week. Um, so, Apart from all the other great stuff on this web page that I'm sticking in the chat, you might get some ideas for names to call your uh, accessible bird outing because there's some really cool adaptive and is another one that's used often um, adaptive bird outing so check out that website um, for some of those ideas. The other thing I stuck in the chat was our steps to implement um, that's short for steps to implement accessible and inclusive birding in your community and that has that list that Virginia went through of local disability support groups and other places in your community that you might be able to reach out and invite to come birding with you because you are hosting accessible outings um, that includes bird festivals um, totally. Yes. Reaching out and inviting people means they know for sure that you want them to come. Yes. Um, and then um, I did want to give a plug again to Birdability Week. So, yeah, that web page um, that I just put up will be where we'll announce um, all the different events coming between uh, October 18 to 24. Um, there'll be online prompts and panels and webinars and um, a few um, interactive events. So we're really excited about that and we hope that you'll join us in um, celebrating birding with access challenges. Um, and another thing I wanted to mention too is that because we are a nonprofit, donations are really important. So if you are able and if you feel like this is good work or you've learned something today, um, 
or if you'd just like to support um, what we're doing and help us continue, um, any donation is really appreciated. And that link uh, is in, our, in the chat as well. Um, so I just need to give us a little plug about that. And also social media at Birdability on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter and on YouTube as well. You can find us on YouTube. Um, I think we might have time for one more question um, before we start wrapping up here. Um, if there are questions that we didn't get to that are kind of specific or you really want us to, please reach out um, via email or the contact us page on our website and we'll do our best to get back to you. Um, about that, I am um, planning Redability Week at the moment, so it may take me a little bit of time to get back to you, but I'm excited to, to help in any way that I can or that pass it on to Virginia if it's a question for her. Um, well, here's a question. A birder in a wheelchair is a different shape from a birder on two legs. Do birds respond differently? Are they less inclined to take flight because they see you as less of a threat? Um, well, I don't think I can speak for the birds, but I can tell you that when I sit in one place and don't move, the birds come. So that would probably be the case for anybody, whether they were a disabled or not disabled person sitting in one place. But I haven't seen any difference with the walking people or the people in wheelchairs. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, really interesting question though, for sure. Um, yeah. And then um, one last question, I, I keep lying, but I'm sorry that we just won't get time for everyone's question, but what has been your best experience in showing someone else a bird? Oh my gosh, that is so much fun. Um, I think my my the most fun I had was showing someone in a wheelchair a yellow-breasted chat. And if you know this bird, this bird will sit in undercover forever and make a lot of noise, little mutterings for a long, long time. And so it took us quite a long time um, to find the bird and just in terms of identifying it. And then this person I was trying to help just couldn't see it and couldn't see it. And I'm doing everything I can to help her get on the bird. And she's holding her binoculars, you know, like this. And then finally, the the chat jumps up, like for just a second, as they're wont to do. And just for a second, and he made one of his like, uh, um, um, jackhammer noises you know how they and she she got a big eye full of that yellow chat so yeah that that would they're always always so much fun to help someone get on a bird I love it that's awesome um and I noticed someone else put in the chat about the next session in this series yeah so the next session um the next interview in this series will be on the first Tuesday of every month um until March the next one is um Tuesday the oh I don't even know what the date is whatever the first Tuesday is um we'll I'll be interviewing Jerry Barrier and he is a birder who's been birding since the 70s he's totally blind and has been since birth and um he's got some really cool um tips some really cool stories some really really important insights um and it'll be it'll be really great to chat with him um and keep learning and um about how we can sighted birders can be more welcoming and inclusive and all kinds of things like that. So that's going to be great. We hope you'll join us for that session as well. Thanks so much, Virginia. It's been really awesome chatting oh. with you. Um, I'm really grateful that I get to chat with you every week. Oh <laughs> gosh, thank you, Freya. Really wonderful to, to, yeah, to hear a bit more about your experiences. Um, and thank you for, for sharing some of your story with, with the world. Thank you for all you do, for your great questions and for being the greatest coordinator ever. This was Thank wonderful. You. Thank you, Virginia. Thank you, Freya. Um, it highlighted so much of how we can all benefit from learning more about these experiences. Um, and yeah, benches, benches for everyone. It, it really does help. Thank you to all of you who joined us too and stayed for a full 90 minutes of conversation. 
Freya, did you have anything else that you wanted to add um, before we ended or Virginia? I think I squeezed no. in most things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And thank you. Um, thanks folks for coming and, and for sharing your thoughts and experiences in the chat. Yeah, and don't forget if you were a manual wheelchair user, um, we'd love to hear about your tricks and tips and advice um, in, the, in the survey that you'll get as soon as we finish. So um, please share um, with us so that we can share it with more people. And thank you to Kathy and Melissa and Erica as well for all the help with this webinar. Um, we really appreciate it. And we at, at ABC are so glad that you're here.